are um, doing a live uh, broadcast of a webinar today that's part of the uh, monthly webinar series that's organized by the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative and the University of Minnesota Extension Forestry Team. Uh, so we have broadcast sites around the state. We have five broadcast sites around northern Minnesota. This is one of the broadcast sites that today is hosting our speaker. Uh, and we have a number of people also tuned in on their own computers. So to all of you, uh, wherever you're watching this from, and I know we have one person from, I think he said El Paso, Texas, uh, online. It's good to have you all here. Uh, our speaker today is Gary Johnson. Gary is a <coughs> professor of urban uh, and community forestry here in the Department of Forest Resources. He's going to be uh, giving a presentation that's a little bit different from what we normally do, and we're really excited to have Gary here. Uh, we're going to hear today about how Minnesota's urban forests uh, could be more functional a topic that I think is relevant to um, uh, many of us throughout forestry, whatever realm we work in, uh, many of us live and work in uh, communities that have these uh, urban forests and uh, most of our population uh, really values these forests and we're going to be hearing from Gary a little bit more about that. Those of you watching online, you have a couple of different uh, options. There are a few things you need to know. Uh, you can maximize the slides to make those fill your screen if you're having trouble seeing anything. There's a little button with two diagonal arrows near the upper right corner of the slides. Um, if you want to submit a question, I would encourage you to submit questions throughout. Don't wait for Gary to pause. He will pause a couple of times during the presentation. Uh, but please go ahead and type those into the chat window on the uh, right side of your screen uh, as soon as you're ready to do that. And, and we'll, we'll then have those ready to forward on to Gary during his next break. Those of you watching at a broadcast site, whether it's St. Paul or elsewhere, just get your question. You'll, you'll have an opportunity to either, those of you in St. Paul, to just ask. I think our mic will pick up the questions for the online audience. Uh, at other broadcast sites, just get your questions to the broadcast site hosts. Um, I think that's all we've got. Again, questions of any type are welcome in the chat pod, and I'm going to hand the floor to Gary. Gary Thank Johnson. You. I'd like to have a dollar for every time I've been introduced as giving a little bit of a different type of presentation. Um, I think what's really going to be different today, I don't know if the people that are off campus will be able to see it, but we have puppeteers off to the side of the room that are basically going to be acting out the entire presentation. So I do hope it comes across on the webinar. If I do get too formal, tell me to stop being formal and ask questions. Um, this is, it's interesting that this would be considered an unusual or a different type of topic or presentation because we're going to be talking about the places where you live, where almost all of us live in Minnesota. So in terms of natural resources, we do have, I think innately we all have a connection to uh, nature in some, to some degree, uh, some type of nature, whether you prefer the wide open spaces of the prairie, which has its own unique beauty, or maybe you prefer the woodlands of northern Minnesota, which has a different type of beauty. But most of us have this, we're drawn to this resource. And looking at the urban forest as being a function, a functional part of our lives, it, it is part of our infrastructure. So that's how I'm going to be treating this is, that given that it's a part of our infrastructure, how can we manage it to provide services? The, fun, the urban forest is there. No matter what we do, it's going to be there. It's going to be there in one shape or form. It's how we manage it to take most advantage of it that we're going to talk a little bit about today. So in terms of you know, a functional urban forest, it really does dictate to a large degree the quality of our life. And for a lot of people, the, the shorter name for quality of our life is aesthetics. The opposite of aesthetics is anesthetic. So aesthetic is the quality of life. Everything you can think about in terms of the quality of life, the water you drink, the air you breathe, where you recreate, different things like that, that is part of the quality of life. Uh, the visual quality, when I was driving, I was taking a lot of photographs this morning, and it's a spectacular autumn, if you like sugar maples, that are still alive. They're absolutely beautiful. And when the sun dappling through up to this morning, it was, it was spectacular. How, how you can put a value on that, I don't know. But for, for me, it just thrills me. It's part of the quality of my life. Um, you know, blocking uh, sounds, whether it's from 
a, a school football field on Friday nights, or perhaps you live close to the airport or a highway. Uh, this is part. This is one of the roles that the urban forest plays. You know that is very very functional in a wildlife habitat, energy consumption. So a function is actually it's considered as physical real estate, and we're going to try to use that as many ways as possible to provide a service. So if we look at signage, signage is, it, it has a definite function, it has a bunch of functions. But basically it's transferring information, it's guiding you, it's warning you, etc. And the services then that it, it provides are those. Warns you, do not go here. Warns you, um, come back in the autumn or come back next weekend. So that, that is the, the role of signage and, you know, getting a little bit closer, a little more biological bark, very, very functional. And bark, depending on the, on the particular plant, can be very imposing with baroques, for instance. That's why they can tolerate fire so, so well. So the role, that, you know, the service that it provides there, this bark is providing life to the tree in spite of fires or critters chewing on it. Services then, so we're going to take this urban forest and we're going to look at the services that are appropriate for your community. Since we're talking about Minnesota today, um, it's a huge state. It has six major ecosystems and each ecosystem is very unique. So when you talk about the services that it can provide, the urban forest area, provide, you really need to be a little bit more specific as we go through here. And what part of the state are you talking about? What community are you talking about? Is a community going to be a park district? Is a community going to be your neighborhood, et cetera? So recreation, wildlife habitat, clean water, clean air, calming effects, education, these are all services that really vary by community depending upon what the community demands. There are, for instance, I mean, this is a beautiful scene, and the scene could be, you know, satisfying a lot of these things. It's just like, oh, Lovely. This is two minutes from my home. I can deal with the traffic coming home. I can be all upset. And in two minutes, I can get on this trail. I can breathe again. I can calm some mental health. Very important service. Somebody in the western part of the state says, I don't drive on any roads like that. I don't need that to calm me down. I'm a very calm person. So it really does depend upon the community and what type of service is going to be most in demand. As we go through, if we look at scenes like this, and I hope you can see it despite the glare on there, uh, two typical scenes, uh, one in the autumn, late summer autumn, one in the basically late winter, early spring. If you look at these two particular scenes, what services do you see that the urban forest is providing for? And this is response time. Shade. Shade for, for what? Uh, okay. So we, yeah. Yep. Especially up in here. Mm -hmm. So we have shade for the homes. We have energy uh, conservation, theoretically, and it is true. We do have it here. Anything else? Wildlife. Urban wildlife. Absolutely. You know, habitat for wildlife. Very important. Too. Well, how about right in here? This one's a little because of the light. Uh, the, the leaves are off the trees, but everything you see in here is canopy. Any services that you see being provided there? So you have screening. So you have some screening value, too. This photo is taken from um, high-density, high high-rise housing. So looking out on the community. This is Hutchinson, by the way. Any other services that you can see? This is provided right at this point. Energy conservation, again, we're going to talk a lot about the impact that canopy has, whether it's deciduous evergreen, whether it's in the summertime, or if it's in the wintertime, the impact that canopy has on energy consumption. And so this is a very, very important part of the energy efficiency for a community, that it's the little community at the edge of the prairie. Yes. Uh, stormwater services. Absolutely. Uh, one of the points brought up stormwater services. And in particular up here, where not only do we have a lot of canopy that is kind of interrupting rainfall, a little bit of evaporation for it. If you look closer to where it's growing, these are generous, very pervious spaces. So it's not just water hitting the tree and then falling to a road and rushing down to the stormwater area. 
This is actually water, some interception by the trees, but then it's trickling down to these very pervious surfaces and being soaked up. Very efficient system here. And one of the things I would like to point out, we're going to be talking a lot about trees and shrubs today, but we're also going to be talking about critters. We're going to be talking about ground covers, uh, different uh, flowers, etc. This is part of the urban forest. If you think about when you walk through the forest, there's a heck of a lot more than trees. There's understory trees, there's shrubs, there's forests, there's grasses, there are critters in there. There's this wonderful life below ground as you go through it. And it's the same in the urban forest, too. So just, you know, this is completely arbitrary, but I have a big desk today, so I get to be the controller of arbitrary things. We're going to look at five community service areas, just my name for it. And service area one is this quality of life. So, Kay, you probably recognize this scene. This is from one of our metropolitan communities. And part of the quality of life would be physical health. Do I have the opportunity to safely recreate outside of a gymnasium? Absolutely. And in an area like this, you have designated paths. It's a very, very pleasant scene. Um, people are going to recreate, even, even if the scene is not pleasant, but the fact that it is pleasant makes it even nicer. Yeah, it's a very calming effect, plus it's recreational, and it's available. You have so many different you know, elements of the services that can be provided. And if you look at this scene, um, what's your reaction to that scene? By the way, that's St. Paul, Minnesota. That's about a mile from... It's not very pretty. It's about a mile from campus. Many years ago. That's Larpenter and Lexington. And this is before there was a lot of intervention by trees and landscape architects and good planners. And when you look at this, like, this is not a place that, you know, if I need to buy something quick and just get in and get out, yeah, which is fine. But I don't want to linger here. And, Kay, in terms of stormwater management, this is probably the poster child for not stormwater management. And heat islands. And heat islands. Absolutely, absolutely. And heat island is a way of life, even in Minnesota, even in northern climates. And if you need proof of that, this coming summer, middle of July, go to one of these parking lots, take off your shoes and socks, and walk across it. And you'll understand heat island effects. And especially this capturing and holding of heat. But, you know, physical health and comfort, recreational opportunities like the I have emotional health, economic health, community culture. I think a lot of people, I live in St. Paul, and very, I'm, I'm very proud to be a resident of St. Paul. Um, if St. Paul, if this was a character of St. Paul, I wouldn't be sprout. It's like the character of a gazillion other places in the world. But this has changed a lot. Um, almost 80% of the United States population in the lower 48 states lives in urbanized area. And I don't use the term urbanized like the U.S. Census does. Uh, I grew up in the country, very rural area. We didn't have curbs. We didn't have buried utilities. We didn't have water and sewer lines. We didn't have somebody plowing our lane or anything like that. That's rural. An urbanized area really don't think so much in terms of population. Do they have services? Has the area been altered and provide those services? That's an urbanized area. That's a community, regardless of size. So we're going to look at communities today that range from Chicago down to Hendricks. Hendricks, 753 people. They're all urbanized areas. So everything we talk about today is going to be appropriate in some sense. So 80%, and this is very true for the state of Minnesota, too, about 80% of us live in an urbanized area. And in terms of the lower 48 states, this 80 percent of the population lives on somewhere between three and a half and four percent of the land cover in the lower 48 states. So we're kind of packed in. We like each other, hopefully. Um, and the urban forest really contributes to us liking each other. If we all lived in that parking lot that had nothing but amorphic surfaces and heat island and wind, et cetera, we'd probably all be pretty grumpy. But because of the urban forest, we can tolerate each other. And there is estimated to be about 4 billion trees in our urban forest in the lower 48 states. That's a lot of tree, a lot of canopy cover in there, providing this quality of life. 
this calming effect, these, these options for recreation. Um, but you know what? Those four billion trees in the canopy that they provide, they're not evenly distributed. So this is going to be one of the challenges we're going to talk about today, how we can make the urban forest in Minnesota more functional. And this is a scene from a community in Minnesota, too. So even though we have all these trees, we have you know, this climate that is great for growing trees. It's not always evenly distributed to where people are. Service area two, energy consumption. Good part about the scene, bad part about the scene. Anybody that has mistakenly placed trees as, uh, as uh, snow shelter belts or snow fences probably have made this mistake. You never ever place your, your snow fence or your shelter belt upwind and close to the area you don't want snow to have. This is a good example, though, of what a shelter belt does or what a massive canopy does. It slows down winds. It slows down winds, especially in the wintertime. Unfortunately, if those winds are carrying snow, it slows down the winds enough that the snow drops. So there's, there's the disservice of some canopy cover in here. But energy consumption is very, very critical. Philip Pichandi took his uh, master's uh, degree from this department, and he had just a, an outstanding um, research in Hutchinson, Minnesota. And I think um, he's the only student I have for a master's degree that was 500 pages long. It was just an amazing <coughs> amount of data that was collected on this. But what came out of this was the efficiency of canopy, not for, for energy conservation in the wintertime, not just in your yard, but canopy cover that was 100 to 1,500 feet away. That was the impact zone. And that was that 10% canopy cover. If you added on another 10%, 20, got even better. Added on another 30%, got even better yet. Added on another 40%, got even better yet. Somewhere between 40 and 50%, you hit that law of diminishing returns. But up to that point, it was just a very significant dollar and cents contribution to this community in money that they didn't have to spend on heating. So the, the impact of canopy uh, is not just in your yard, it's not just alongside the road here, but up to 1,500 feet away, which is where that park may be. Now, a similar study back, you know, years earlier than that, 1991, the Chicago Urban Forest Climate Project, which just it, 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 I think it's interesting reading, but we go back to this being a very different presentation again. And the puppeteers are doing a great job, by the way. Uh, in Chicago, they determined that three mature trees per building lot. This is 1991. So, you know, it's going to be a little bit different in terms of dollar saved. Somewhere between $50 and $90 a year. But why would there be a difference there? How big is the tree? How healthy is the tree? Exactly where is it placed? But this is a typical lot in Minneapolis with three mature trees. So that's what we're talking about. Three mature trees has this impact. It's a little bit more difficult. Another shot from the community in Minneapolis when you have uh, you know, multiple level housing, high density housing, it's a little bit more different. And you start depending a little bit more on architecture. You know, is this building raft well, is it insulated well, et cetera. Uh, but trees do contribute, and it's very well documented. Service area three, as James Carville said, it's the economy stupid. And for a lot of people, this is the one and only service they care about. You know, what's this worth? What's the asset? Is it going to save me money? And it does. It's, it saves you money. It makes you money. And in particular, in an area like this, this is a pretty nondescript scene. But if you go there, starting in mid-afternoon till dark, it's filled with tables and chairs and people sitting there, dining, drinking, chatting, socializing. The businesses on the street understand the service that trees bring to them. And these, these are non-spectacular trees, but they're providing this ambiance, this, this seating environment that people not only go there, they want to stay there too. And there's been so much documentation. This is a rendered drawing of a converted uh, shopping area. So imagine this with no trees, no turf, no shrubs or anything. It's basically buildings on one side, buildings on the other. And this is, this is kind of one of the goals of uh, the Green Line going uh, through downtown St. Paul, where all the trees have been planted. And they're someday getting to this point. But there's been so much research, really good research, documenting 
the value of the urban forest to businesses. They draw people. They do not discourage people. They do not block science to the point where they discourage people. They keep people there. People want to stay there, shop, linger. Two words. If you're really interested in this part of urban forestry and services, you only need to know two words. Kathy Wolf. And you go to her website, incredible amount of research-based information on there, answers all those questions with facts. But this is, this is one of the tremendous services. There's another way of placing a dollar value on trees. And for if you're, if you're an arborist or if you're a landscape architect, uh, this is a system that, that's been developed by a certified, uh, certified um, tree and landscape association or a council for tree and landscape uh, um, appraisers. And what this does is it puts a dollar value on a tree. And it's called a replacement value. If this tree was lost, what was it worth? Well, it depends. How big was it? What species was it? What condition was it in? Where was it placed? What part of the country was it in? All this is built into this, this formula, and it's a very extensive formula. But using that formula, the compensatory value for all these trees, the roughly 4 billion trees in lower 48 states, in 2002 is calculated out very conservatively as $2.4 trillion. That's your asset. Now, what are you willing to invest in this asset to keep it an asset? Or do you want it to become a brown liability? Those are your choices. Delayed or deferred maintenance has never, ever worked. It hasn't worked on roofs. It hasn't worked on lawns. It doesn't work on the urban forest. You have to invest in this, in this particular um, uh, functional part of your urban environment because it is valuable. There's another way of looking at it, too, for the people who go, oh, those are tree huggers. Of course they're going to give this, this outrageous value to it. Let's go to somebody that doesn't love trees or doesn't, at least doesn't hug trees or doesn't hug them in, in public. Um, and using the sedonic value system, it, it's basically valuing the, the urban forest based on the market value of homes sold or the ease of selling those homes. What's the difference between if your home sells in 150 days or if it sells in two days? Interest. You may have to be renting a place in the meantime. That's part of the value on this, market value. And this also takes into consideration, too, uh, rental properties. What, how much can they charge? So there is a significant contribution of the urban forest too, the market value of homes, the ease of selling homes, and the price people pay for renting apartments, houses, et cetera. And again, this is up to within 250 meters. So, you know, that's fairly close to what Philip found for uh, energy conservation, at least within that range. So if you have a home or an apartment uh, and it's near a park, it's across the street, or if it's a block away, that is impacting your financial in, in a good way. And years ago, in the mid-90s, we had a student here at the university that worked with me. And we ran the same kind of study, and we selected six parks in the metropolitan area, ranging from parks in very expensive, very sweet areas that none of us will ever be able to live in, to areas that were very, very low-income, high unemployment. And here's what we found. When you moved one block away, two blocks away, and three blocks away, the price, the market value, the taxable market value of that home declined at the exact same rate. Isn't that interesting? The exact same rate. Now, obviously, in the very wealthy neighborhoods, you may have a million-dollar home, and in the unemployed type of neighborhoods, it may only be a $30,000 home, but they all declined each block weight at the exact same percentage rate. Very interesting. And I thought maybe, oh, you know, that's a nice little unique difference. Right? And then I found more and more studies that basically came up with the same thing. The closer you are to a park or an open space or a wild area in an urbanized area, the better it affects your, your property values. Service Area 4, Urban Law Life Habit. All right, that slide. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Desirable urban wildlife. Be a little bit more clear on that. A desirable wildlife tends to be specific to your audience. And if you uh, speak to adults, various ages, adults tend to like things that they can view. Oh, I love those birds. Look at those geese coming in. 
No, maybe not geese. Um, they, they like seeing deer. They like seeing critters like that. Um, uh, squirrels. They think they're some people. Some people like to eat them. Rabbits. Some people like watching them. Like you, but they're they're looking at these type of critters, bear. You know, they, uh, they they tend to prefer things that they can watch. So that's if if your audience is more adult, if it's part of the adult. If it's more youthful, totally different story. This goes back to some research we conducted here um, in the mid '90s, a child's view of the urban forest, and then we worked with Minnesota Port Society on this too. What do kids like? Kids like things they can grab. They can get down on their hands and knees. Things they can pick up and scare other people with, chicken. So they like things that are slower, that are closer to the ground, things they can handle. And I know what you're thinking, it's like, well, can't they handle bats? This is how far removed we are from being kids, quite honestly. Because when I first was putting this together, it was like, you know, I remember my brother and I doing that. I also remember the time, for whatever reason, we thought a Quaker Oats can, which really wasn't a can, it was cardboard, would be a perfectly safe place to put all these baby bats that we found in. It wasn't. And they got out in the basement. So, <laughs> but, you know, this is what little kids prefer. So this is a service that's being, the, the imagination, the excitement, the learning involved, watching this turn into this, and the different things that attract it. Uh, that is the service that it provides. Um, service Area 5 societal benefits, and a lot of people would argue this, you should just stop right here. You should start with this, and you should stop with this. This is the most important service that they provide. Looking at that scene, what is it? Well, it's a bunch of trees in the closet. It's a sitting area. It's a gathering area. It's an area not associated. There are a lot of businesses in there, there are other functional buildings in there, but it's not associated with someone's backyard, not associated with a certain neighborhood, it's associated with the community. This is an area where the community can come, they can listen to music, they can chat with each other, they can look at each other in their eyes. They can go over any prejudices. There are young people, there are elderly people, there are people that have been in the United States for generation after generation, there are people that just moved to the United States. There are people that speak our language, there are people that we can't understand, and they can't understand us. This is a gathering place. This is, for a lot of people, the most important service provided. Areas we can serve, we can, we can learn in, we can teach people. Um, areas we can serve the community. This is a group of people down in Rochester, they're called citizen pruners. And what they do is they go out and they prune off the sending branches of trees in public spaces boulevards, parks, ranches that slap you in the face when you're walking through and it's a little bit dark, ranches that are blocking sight lines and intersections, that beautiful, that beautiful tree in the boulevard that looks like it has a spurt of branches is blocking that car going 40 mile an hour down the street. These people go in and prune them off. Are they saving the community tons of money? Could be. Could be. Why pay somebody arborist wages when all you need is to get on your hands and knees and correct off. I think what they're doing more than anything else is building a connection to their community. You know, volunteers may not save money, but they save programs. Because now this is part of their community. They have a vested interest in it. They get to meet each other. Why do volunteers volunteer? A lot of them for one reason, to meet other people, to get to know their neighbors, neighbors to talk about things, to plan parties. Yeah, let's have, let's have a progressive dinner after this pruning event. One of the pruning events we had down there, and it's totally my fault, I didn't watch the weather. It was so cold, I thought I was going to die. We had the greatest bonfire and hot cocoa party after that. And, and there's, there's a lot of bonding from people and a lot of nasty looks thrown my way too. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of research Taylor. Uh, Francis Quo, William Sullivan, they've worked together a lot, and there's a lot of published information provided on what impact green has on how young people act, how, how mature they are, how calm they are, how willing they are to delay gratification, increasing attention spans, etc. There's very, very good documentation on it, and one of the studies that was very interesting is just being able to see green 
from your window had an amazing impact on young women. A couple of the things that it had on young women, it improves their, their self-esteem, the way they view themselves. It also uh, improved their control. They were willing to delay gratification a little bit more. And for, for boys, it, it, it took their attention span from 0.5 seconds and lengthened it to 0.55 seconds, which apparently is statistically significant. <laughs> uh, but it does have this impact. So it doesn't even have to be your own yard. Can you see it? Can you see it? And there was some interesting research many years ago about how people would recover a little bit quicker, depending on why they're in the hospital, uh, based on the view from their window, especially if they're in there for a longer time, like two weeks or three weeks. If they're staring out at another wall or a parking lot, it's like, where's the remote? But if they're looking out at a, at a garden, if they're looking out at people playing in a courtyard, et cetera, with trees and vines and shrubs and flowers, uh, it, it just lifted their spirits and they statistically recovered faster. So how can Minnesota's urban forests become more functional? Well, it depends. Maybe um, they could provide knitted sweaters for people when it gets this. This is tongue in cheek. Um, but uh, if you look at the, this is called yarn bombing. <laughs> and it is kind of interesting. This down, and this actually is in Iowa City, and I love it when they do it too, because they can put it on every single tree downtown. And when you first see it, it's it's what? And then pretty soon you stop asking why. This is just interesting. I want to walk. I want to see if all of them, yeah, they do, have sweaters on. Well, recommendation 1.0. Set canopy goals. Don't think about numbers of trees. Get that out of your head. That is Gary's recommendation, my opinion. There is an obsession. How many trees did you get planted? How many are going to live? That's what I'm interested in. And how many are going to live and get big enough to provide canopy? I have never known a normal person to sit in the shade of a tree trunk. They don't provide much tree shade. It's the canopy that provides shade. Um, tree trunks are the utility poles. You know, it's the canopy that is valuable. For, it's valuable for recreation. It's valuable for setting a mood, it's valuable for uh, energy conservation, et cetera. And so think more in terms of canopy rather than, so what, what's going to be our goal in this? And there have been some published goals uh, from American Forest. We're in the part of the country that <clears throat> theoretically we could say our goal is 40% canopy. It means nothing. It means nothing to me. You're looking at a community here that has a little over a 30% canopy cover. That's fairly close. Does that look like 30% canopy cover to you? No, no. So really look at canopy goals for land use areas, not just by the community. So when you say, well, our goal is 40% or 35 or 30% canopy cover, that's great. That's a good start. What are you talking? You know, if, if you're talking uh, highly, um, covered, especially with impervious area, a lot of canyons built from buildings in the downtown area, and you're going to try to get 30% canopy cover, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You can get that with awnings and pergolas. It's going to be really tough to get that with tree cover. So let's get a little bit more specific. Where are you going to have this canopy cover? Um, how about parking lots like this? What's under that parking lot? The, the environment of that parking lot, yes, that's going to be really tough. So sitting canopy, but well, let's, let's say that in the, the transportation areas and the areas that we really want to have an impact on stormwater runoff, we're going to go, I don't know if, I don't know if 30 percent is good enough for that. I'd like to go 50 percent. That's going to be our goal. You know, the nice thing about setting goals is it's a, lot say, it's a lot better to say, well, you know, we'll see what happens. And when you say we'll see what happens, then no. So if the goal is 50%, maybe you fail at that goal and you only get 40%, 35%. That's still pretty good. And it's placed in an area, too, that it is going to be effective in this transportation corridor. Well, you know, in the downtown area, you know, we're not going to have, how are you going to shade this building? 
for that. You, you're not going to shade that building. You can put rooftop gardens on it. Those are nice amenities, but that's about it. Let's shade the areas where people congregate. So we'll have 70% canopy cover in these little oases, these little parks distributed in, in downtown areas, in, in these urbanized areas. Um, and, you know, let's look at the natural areas, the corridors in here. Let's go 90% canopy cover in there. This is a connected corridor uh, along the Mississippi River. The migratory birds use it. There's a lot of wildlife use in there. If that canopy cover is lost, there's a lot of topography there. Erosion is going to be even more of an issue. I want 90% in there. Actually, I want 100% in layers, but at least 90%. And then residential areas, and I think a lot of people are a little bit hesitant to, to say, well, I have a goal for residential areas because yeah, I don't know if I should say it, though, because I don't own that area. It's part of the urban forest. It's actually the biggest part of the urban forest. And there are ways you can impact that, too. Give away trees. Why not? It's going to benefit everybody. Remember, your home is going to benefit from trees 1,500 feet away. So if your neighbor is planting them or a park is planting them, it's going to benefit your home, especially in the wintertime. <clears throat> Excuse me. So setting these goals by zone, depending on where you live, and if you live in parts of the state that are wicked windy, that trees are not supposed to be there, far western part of the state, those trees that are there really are only supposed to be in ravines and alongside rivers. But the trees that are planted there make the communities inhabitable. They're habitable. It makes them pleasant. It blocks the winds. It makes them pleasant in the wintertime, springtime, summertime, autumn. Without those trees, it's going to go back to being windswept. And, you know, that's fine. But it's, it's not so fine for energy consumption. It's not so fine for plain frisbee. Um, two parking areas. Why couldn't all parking areas look like that? They're very, very efficient. Yeah, we took away a few spaces. How many times have you gone to a parking area, a commercial parking area, and every single space was jam-packed filled? Pretty rare. It's usually the day after Thanksgiving. Most of the time, there are plenty of open spaces. So being a little bit more realistic, instead of designing parking areas for the busiest time of year, why not for the average time of year? Why not shuttle people? One of the things I love about uh, the Como Zoo is they have the shuttle buses so people can park by the state fairground and they just shuttle people constantly. And they, and that's great, rather than having a, just a, a gross amount of parking space available by the zoo and the, the park. So these two parking areas in here are very, very good. They're very healthy trees in there, they're providing canopy, they're intercepting a lot of rainwater, purposely took this during a rainstorm, uh, intercepting a lot of rainwater, that's going to uh, evaporate off, but then when it falls, it's going to go into these larger planting areas, grasses, annuals in the spring, springals, etc. That's a nice system. That is a very, very nice service being provided. Recommendation 2.0, act recklessly. Be different when you plant trees at spacings. This 40 foot on center, it is not biblical. I don't, you know, this goes back 60, 70 years for when homes were being built after World War II. It's like, let's make sure every house has a tree in front of it and these new subdivisions. And it came out to about 40 feet. And then somebody said, well, that must be right. And they need to be lined up because that's the way they were lined up. There. No, be reckless. You do crazy things like plant a single tree. If you're only shading a small area, if that's really all you need to camp in a smaller area, plant a single tree with a really broad camp. You've got enough ground cover in here to capture um, storm water. It's not going to run off. Think 10 feet on center. Oh my gosh, you can't do that. You cannot plant trees 10 feet on center. You're going to ruin the silhouette. Ruin the silhouette. Ruin it. Save the silhouettes for formal gardens, for fancy schmancy gardens. You want canopy. That's what you care about. What is the cover for this whole thing? Well, trees can't live. Have you ever walked in the woods? You're going to have trees two feet on center, four feet on center, six, 12, 40, 60, 80, whatever. You have all these different, you have different layers in there. I'll show you something really cool later on. <clears throat> but be reckless. Do um, you like this scene? It's basswood. It's 20, or, uh, 20 feet on center. Most people, if you say 20 feet on center, you can't do 
Are things got to be 40 feet on center? Why? I don't know. I read a book once. That's 20 feet on center. That looks pretty nice, doesn't it? I know it's 20 feet on center because I measured it two weeks ago. <clears throat> and then this is just pure chaos. They probably should pave the whole area over because you have, <laughs> you, you have understory trees, you have tall trees, you have them, some of them are 80 feet apart, 60, 40, 12, 6. It's, just, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's very functional, too. You want to go. I hope half the people looking at that scene are thinking, where is that? <laughs> Recommendation three, why plant it if you can preserve it? We, the urban forest should not be disposable resource. None of us are ever going to see the century old tree if we plant it today. None of us will. But if we can find trees that are well placed, that are in good condition, that are appropriate for the area, that are providing the canopy, this is you know early spring, that are providing the canopy desire, every effort should be made to save those trees. Now these are all American elms and there was pushback in this particular community. Gonna have to inject those things. How much money do you waste on killing weeds in your lawn? How much fungicide have you put on your hybrid tea roses to make sure the leaves didn't fall off prematurely? How many chemicals are you putting on your grapes and your apples? And you're hesitating to invest in, in a resource like that? This is in Morris, Minnesota. The wind never stops in Morris, Minnesota. Trees are not supposed to be in Morris, Minnesota. They grow along uh, the Palm de Terra River, and that's where they're supposed to be. But this is what makes Morris, Minnesota a nice community to live in. They provide that canopy, that windbreak, et cetera. This is Minnehaha Falls Park. Those trees, those, those uh, uh, oaks, they're all pretty much at an even age stand. The whole area was logged when Fort Snelling was built. So part of the construction of Fort Snelling and the fuel that was supplied for it. So all those trees have regenerated. Every effort should be made to keep those trees. Save them. No construction damage to them. If Oak Wilt moves into the area, control it. Brutal Blight moves into the area, control it. No question. Absolutely no question. That is a resource that we'll never, ever see if you and I plant trees today, Mary. Maybe kids, maybe grandkids. Who knows? Why plant it if you can preserve it? This whole area, this plaza area in here, this is such a resource for that community. They're going through and, and, and conducting quite a bit of reconstruction in this area, but the efforts that community is making to save those trees is phenomenal. Why? Because it's canopy. It's there. That is, I mean, this is all hardscape in here. Getting trees up to that size again, it's going to take so long. Businesses will move. People will stop coming there. It's worth preserving. Um, these wild areas, natural areas, right in the bowels, right in the centers of our city, these areas where it offers this little bit of rest that we can, you know, we can't go up north, we can't go to southeast Minnesota, we can't go to all these different parts, beautiful parts of the state in the evening when we get home from work, but we can take a walk through there. It's right outside of our door. Everything should be done to preserve this area. And that includes you have to enforce it. There's no substitute. If you go, well, I'm going to do it. I don't know. We have an ordinance. It's paper. An ordinance is paper. That's all it is. It's got to be enforceable. If you're not going to enforce it, then I don't even want to talk to you because you just don't care, quite honestly. You should care about these. Recommendation 4.0, multi-tax the urban forest. One of my friends in Colorado, city forester, for Denver, Denver has the same problem that we have in the upper Midwest. There's an obsession with maples. And why do people, are they obsessed with maples? Because they love the color red. So his idea is put red in the shrub bed. You think it's tough growing healthy maples in Minnesota. Try growing them in Denver. Yeah, it's next to impossible. They are not supposed to be there. However, look at all the options you have for the shrub bed layer. Plus, Look at all the food you're providing for wildlife in here, the habitat for wildlife. Um, sorry, I know if there are foresters in there, most foresters hate hazel, but squirrels love the fruit on it. Look at the color of that foliage. I took that picture a week ago. It's even more beautiful now. Um, arrowwood viburnum, it's native to Minnesota. If you want to plant one plant, that is the best plant for attracting birds. That's what you love, plant arrowwood viburnum. Beautiful, just starting to turn its autumn foliage, kind of wine. And then aronia, 
one of the one of the fruits with the highest percentage of antioxidants in it. Mix it in, use that fruit. The birds are probably going to beat you to it, but if they don't, use it to make your own juices. And again, in the autumn, the foliage trims growing up red. So multitask. Use some different plants. Use a you know, if your clients are primarily, if the park is primarily, the planting is primarily for young people, get young people plants in there. Plants that are going to attract snakes, toads, butterflies, insects, lightning bugs. Although I don't encourage them to put them in take it, they're going to. And uh, grasses. The grasses are tremendous plants for, for erosion control, for absorbing rainwater, keeping it from getting to the stormwater systems. Um, you know, you have to get water in there, or preserve water, especially if you want wildlife. That is one of the critical um, elements of habitat for wildlife is you have to have water. So if you can preserve a stream or open up a stream or some type of water, it's going to be in there. But also, you know, so what if a tree dies? Leave it there. Cut off, get, you know, behead it. Take away from the dangerous part. Uh, don't leave it in the boulevard, but if it's in a park, it's not right alongside the trail, leave it as a snag tree. This is right on campus, and I love this tree. This whole section is dead on it, but it's always filthy with little birds in there. And it's just nice that I know I can go to that tree, and I'm going to see that type of activity. And I am definitely not a youth. And I'm not a bird watcher, but I, I do love that kind of stuff. Minimize risk, recommendation 5.0. This is a before tree until a citizen pruner group goes through. This is risky. Blocking sight lines. Yes, stop saying here. There's no, there, you know, you barely see this car there. So that is an unacceptable risk. So if this, if this uh, resource is going to be beneficial, especially for the quality of life, you, you can't have these unacceptable risks, at least not very many of them. Nothing is risk-free. Absolutely nothing is risk-free. Stairs, lights, streets, curbs, cars, nothing is risk-free. But what we try to do is bring the risk down to an acceptable level. So yeah, it's not perfect, but it's better in points. Do not plant 70-foot tall trees in four-foot wide boulevards. <laughs> this is the one time in your life where you're going to reflect back and say, I remember that from the physics class. <laughs> This has nothing to do with species, it has everything to do with bigness, and then smallness of, of footprint, too. Because at some point, if you look at the different colored concrete right in here, uh, that big tree started lifting the sidewalk. And so that's an unacceptable risk, having this lift in the sidewalk. So let's go in there, we'll cut the roots, we'll put in a new sidewalk, and then a windstorm comes along, and big trees go over. And they cause a lot of damage. So that's what you're looking at in here. You'd be a little bit more proportionate. And you can see in this, the tree is already protecting from windstorm. You can see where this one panel was replaced because the tree was too big for a small boulevard. They had to cut the roots because the roots were lifting the sidewalk, put in the sidewalk. The cutting of that made the tree unstable. Unacceptable risk. How could it be avoided? Don't plant a 70 foot tall tree in a four foot wide boulevard. Yes, question? So you have one of those four foot wide boulevards in the city. Um, and how do, you, how do you try and get that? 50% can't over that's what you're aiming for when you can't get those giant trees. Great, great question. You plant giant trees, <laughs> just not in the four-foot wide boulevard. So the question is, if you want this 50% canopy cover um, and you have four-foot wide boulevards, how can you do that when I've just told you don't plant giant trees? Plant them up in the front yard. This is where I would donate trees to the public. Because if we go in the front yard from this, so four feet, five-foot wide sidewalk, plant maybe five or six feet into there. So, you know, we end up being maybe 15 or 20 feet away from the curb. Big trees are going to have expansive canopies that are going to, that are going to give us that 50% cover or 40 or whatever it is. Yeah, it, it's, it, that's also called a green easement. In a lot of areas, uh, that front yard is actually right of way yard. And so the community will provide trees for that green easement. Sometimes it'll be a conditional. We'll give you these trees. We'll plant them. You're responsible for maintaining them. Some communities do everything. They buy them, they plant them, they maintain them. Sometimes utility companies do it. There, those are some of the options, though. To me, an, an unacceptable option is putting a tree that you know is going to get too big and it's going to cause damage. Right about the time it's contributing. That's the worst thing. 
So minimizing risk, you know, avoiding plants that you know are decay prone, you know they're going to break out in storms, it's just, it's their nature. Or maybe their architecture is so poor that they can fall apart if you're not giving them a lot of attention. Uh, don't plant trees to you, don't bury trees, plant them. But, you know, trees that have particular problems with planting depth like this, um, can you imagine the campers in that campground just going, how did this happen? How did I dodge this bullet? This is not a staged photo. That's where that tree fell during the winds were in Minnesota. Um, and again, they were buried too deeply. They had stem girdling roots and they snapped off. Unacceptable risk. As much as we, we love some of the new elms, because they are Dutch elm disease resistant, many, many of them are obstreperous and they're not really designed for or communities or landscapes where people can't give them a lot of attention. When you plant these aggressively growing elms that are resistant to veg disease, but you say, well, you know, I can't prune them though, or I'm on a 10-year pruning cycle, don't plant them. That's, it's going to be an unacceptable risk. Move to a different one. When you see decay is the number one pre-existing condition for tree failure in wind loading events. It's the number one pre-existing condition. And when you see, this is how foresters are born, by the way. Um, when you see in a park, a heavily used park, a, a, col a column and a cavity of decay like that, as beautiful as that tree is, oh, it's a beautiful tree. It's got to go. It's gotta, that's an unacceptable risk. You, the worst part is you have no idea when it's going to fail. You just know it's, it's much more likely to fail. Yes. Is that an example of one that you top then and leave the standing stem? Excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the point that was made was, would this be a good example in the park, the tree that if you topped it, maybe go up 10, 12, 20 feet, get rid of the wind sail. That's the big thing. And leave it there as critter habitat. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. The good part about it is, if you notice in here, there's no pathway, there's no bench or anything near it. So even though people are using the area, they're not really drawn to it. So it would be an excellent one for pileated woodpeckers or raccoons, something like that. 6.0, dwell on character and site credentials more than hometowns. Bald cypress. What do we know about bald cypress? It grows in Minnesota, especially the southern part of Minnesota. The so cypress does really well on oxygen-poor soils, compacted soils or flooded soils. It is deciduous. It's a deciduous conifer, like uh, larches, uh, grows fast. Uh, anecdotally, I've worked with this tree for 30 years plus. Uh, it's got really good chops for de-icing salt tolerance. I've seen this tree in drainage ditches all over the Midwest, getting all that runoff de-icing salt. They don't skip a beat. Who cares where it came from? It grows in Minnesota. It's, it's providing a function. It's going to survive on some of the hostile sites. I don't care about its hometown. Manchurian ash. This comes from the same part of the world that the emerald ash borer comes from. This has really, really good proven resistance to emerald ash borer. It's also been growing in Minnesota for decades. This is on the Crookston campus. They have so many trees. Manchurian ash on the Crookston campus. Now, they were not prophetic thinking 30 years ago, oh, I'm a last boy. They were thinking, we can't get anything to grow here. It is windy. It's cold in the wintertime. It's wicked hot in the summertime. The pH of the soil is over 8.0. What's going to grow here? Manchurian ash. So this is a tree that's been planted for other reasons, but now it's, it's even more valuable. Forget about its hometown. Does it do well? Northern Catalpa. This is, uh, we have been conducting tree performance on brownfield sites and hostile sites since 1994. You're looking at the number one tree. Number one tree in terms of survival and overall condition for urban areas. You can throw this in the worst site imaginable. And it, it does great, it does great. Our worst tree is our native red oak. And I, it's always easy for me to remember because of all the plantings we monitor, not a single red oak has survived. So, forget about it. Are you talking about red oaks in brown sites? Or yes, urban, urban areas. Some of these are schoolyards, some of these are brownfields, some of these are alongside of uh, Hiawatha Avenue. 
kind of hostile areas. Definitely not native moon soil. Definitely not that. Poorly drained, high pH, clay, compacted, just nasty stuff. That's where this one thrives. Number two would be our native, our native hawthorns, especially uh, cockspur hawthorn. Okay, recommendation seven, involve citizens. Get them involved in this. Remember, volunteers may not save you money, but they do save programs. And so if they're involved, and in, this is in beautiful Hendricks, Minnesota, they're, they're involved in caring for their trees, monitoring the trees. There's a town of 753 people when we put together a call for volunteers to work on inventory and surveying and replanting their trees, et cetera. We had a group of 19 people from the community of 753. I mean, very, very involved people, too. They went through all the training. They love their trees. Why? Half the town's in South Dakota, southwest Minnesota. And to the west of them, that half the town's in South Dakota. It's a huge lake. The wind roars across this lake. Those trees make this area livable. And they built their own community gravel bed. They buy their own trees. They put the trees in the spring. They pull them out in the autumn and plant them. And they put a really cheap price on them. You can get a really nice tree in this community for 15 bucks. 20 months. And their reason is they want homeowners to buy these trees, put them on their property. They don't have a forestry department here. Uh, the previous ma uh, city mayor that we worked with, he was city mayor, but he was also a local grave digger. And he worked, he cut down trees for people. And he had earth moving uh, business too. They don't have a city arborist. Uh, all the trees are watered by normal people that are doing it. And so they're just giving people great deals on these trees so they get canopy cover in the community. And they don't have a burden on the community to support it. Plant trees don't bury them. Uh, this was a, a really nice planting project over in Hennepin County um, a couple weeks ago now where they had a great demonstration on using uh, bare-rooted trees pulled from their community gravel bed, uh, best planting practices versus what you see here. This tree, these trees, they're going to be there. They're going to provide canopy for a long time. These trees right in here, this one, you, we have a beautiful growing season. Look at that grass. Look at the rest of the trees. Look at those two trees. Right about the time those lindens are contributing, they're tipping, they're dying. Because they were buried too deeply instead of planted correctly. Adult stem girdling roots, and now they're dying. They just wasted 15 years. Now they have to cut the trees down, start all over again. Plant trees, don't bury them. Sometimes you're going to have to do a little bit of site preparation. It's worth it. This is in downtown St. Paul. Um, this, this would be classified as a brownfield site. It's all introduced soil in there. It was so compacted, unbelievably compacted. So we use radial trenching. Here's the planting, trees plant and radial trench out. The roots just scream right down that minimal disturbance. That tree is going to establish and get big and provide canopy. It was worth the time to prepare it. Here is a pot mound tree. Box the root system with a saw. Get rid of those encircling roots. That's the end of that pot mound problem. Or you can go to a nursery, and we have several in the state of Minnesota that are growing trees in the air pruning pots, but you don't get dysfunctional root systems. They're really good trees. So learning a little bit more about planting trees rather than burying them and what's high quality and what's a waste of money. Allow for the 50% below ground. Boy, I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, this is before downtown Minneapolis. These folks, folks are wonderful trees, and, and they should be allowed to die with some dignity. But these trees are just languishing. This is a close-up to those trees. Why? Because they never thought about that 50% below ground. They thought about the tree trunks. Let's get four trees. Let's get six trees in there. But how many trees did you get planted? Rather than how many trees can live, thrive, provide canopy. So when that area was redone, and really it was redone more to capture runoff water, to sequester all the storm water runoff before it gets into the Mississippi River, capture it into these very suspended pavement areas. This is filled with beautiful soil right there. Now the trees are planted in there. Now they're going to thrive because they're accommodating that 50%. This is in Stockholm. They do it a little bit differently. What do tree roots need? They need water and they need oxygen. Can't you get that with rocks? Yep. 
So this is the Stockholm soil mix, which is basically big rocks, smaller rocks, smaller rocks, smaller rocks, pumice. And then they plant the trees, and the trees are, whoa, sorry, are doing beautifully in this area. These are the trees planted in that rock, small rock, small rock, small rock, pumice. Water and oxygen. Same thing, Charlotte, North Carolina. Below ground, this is all engineered soil. Look at the size of those trees. Beautiful. It works. So preparing the sites, uh, really thinking about that 50% below ground, generous boulevards. This is such old research. Trees, urban trees, boulevard trees are going to perform best on boulevards that are a minimum of 8 to 10 feet wide. You know, the University of Wisconsin showed this 35 years ago, now it's published. Um, it, and this just keeps going on and on for a variety of reasons. When they have to repair any buried utopies, there's still lots of room. But the big thing is that they've got this plate. Now you can have this big tree that's going to provide that 50%, contribute to that 50% canopy, and it's going to be stable. Even if some work needs to be done in there, it's going to be stable. And it's going to be much less likely to live at sidewalks, too. Um, if you don't do that, I mean, these trees, you got your quota in, you planted your trees, great. They're going to give you any canopy. If you're a really teeny person, yes, it's going to give you canopy. <laughs> Eventually, it's going to catch up. Look at the trees here, look at on the other side. Look at all the trees except for in the skinny little boulevard. They're all looking great. Look at the grass. It's looking great. There's irrigation in that area. But this is what the leaves look like on these trees. They didn't allow for the 50% low ground. It's like a little bit each year. It does a couple things. First of all, everybody loves planting. Uh, second of all, you're, only, you're planting in stages. You're planting which you can maintain, which you can water, which you can get past that that installation shock transplant period. Plus, you're building up age diversity, too. You're not going to have a baby boomer force where everything's even aged. This is beautiful up in here, but it's all even aged. When that starts collapsing, boom, it's going to collapse all at once. Down here, look at all the variety of the sizes. And it's a good, healthy urban forest. So plant a little bit. Plant some chaos. I think chaos is so good. This is Swedish Ag Institute, and uh, this is a park. They just planted a park. And if you look in this park, this is year two. All these trees lined out. This, um, if you like corn farming, you'll like this because everything's in this row. And a bit. These are all sorts of different trees. Which ones are going to live? Who knows? Some of them are going to live. Some of them are going to be canopy, super canopy, sub canopy, shrub layer, <clears throat> down in the ground. This is, you know, in a milder climate that we have, but we can duplicate it here. Nature already has. This is one of their parks. This is probably a quarter mile away from the one I just showed you. This is how they established this park. This is 20 years later. Okay. Things survive. You build a plant community here. So now you have a super canopy, a smaller tree, sub canopy, a shrub layers, all this ground cover in there. <clears throat> Why not experiment? It'll take longer than 20 years in Minnesota, so it takes 30 years, or 40 years, 50 years. Why not do it? There's no reason not to try it. If you really like reading, these are just uh, some of the resources that I, I, some of the critical resources that I use putting this together. And um, if, if you would like me to send this to you so you can read these, it, I'd be more willing to do that, because I like to read too. It's how we learn. Instead of making mistakes constantly, we learn from other people's mistakes. And that's the end. Any questions before we leave each other? Yes? Um, I work for the Forest Service, um, the Forest Service Marine Analysis Unit. We just recently started doing urban surveys. Um, Curious. Um, I think it's great. It's been really fun. Got a lot of people I work with that are traditional foresters want to be out in the middle of nowhere. They just don't see any value in why they're being made to do this for their job. And they, don't, they never know how to respond to that. And this is all, but do you have any other recommendations or like little things I can give them to read that are, you know, pamphlets or 
Uh, the comment was made that a lot of the assessment and inventory of urban forest that is being done by agencies um, is being done by employees that aren't real happy about doing it. They're trained foresters, they want to be out in the woods, and they may not see, or they don't, or they refuse to see the value of documenting the urban forest. Nothing you do is going to change your mind. Oh. Yeah, you're not. It's going to have to come at a personal level. I, you know, it, this sounds really cavalier, but if somebody said, well, why should I even be interested in that? Do you want to pay your mortgage next month? Do you, or do you, do, you want to, do you want to get a different job? I mean, you've chosen this. If you're so miserable, you should get a different job. Or you should change your attitude. You know, this is where you live. You know, you're serving 80%. You're helping 80%. You're building a community for 80% of the state's population. Why are you dwelling on this 2% up in this little corner? That's you know? where they live, actually. Yeah. They live out on the blue mountain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where they're very uncomfortable. Yeah, if people have made up their mind digging their heels, and they're, they're, they're not going to. It would be like you convincing me that trees are bad. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> so it, it, it's it's... What it is. Yes, Jerry, we have an online question. Yep. Uh, it would be nice if everybody, every homeowner would watch presentations like this, but, but maybe they won't. So the question is, how can you convince residents to plant trees for canopy cover and not for privacy fences or, or sound buffers? How, how do you get people involved in seeing the value of planting trees? Um, if, if you're going to pick one argument, it's money. It's absolutely money. So it's going to save, you know, now this is going to it's going to sound uh, like I'm joking, but I'm not. In, in terms of saving money on winter energy consumption, the best thing you could do is talk your kids into moving out of the house. Because winter energy consumption is based upon warm air displacement. Every time that front door goes open, it closes open and closes open. I don't care how many trees you have. I don't care how well wrapped and insulated that house is. All that warm, heated up air is just leaving. So that, that is an incredible burden on that. But if, you, if you're trying to convince somebody that's worthy to plant canopy, probably the best thing is well-placed trees are going to save you money. They're going to keep your roof. You know, well-placed trees are going to keep your roof intact for more years you're gonna, uh, instead of breaking down in, in the gross sunlight. Uh, paved areas, black blacktop driveway, sidewalks, especially blacktop, they were going to last longer with shade. But, you, you know, there are some people that just, um, they don't like leaves because they go in gutters. It's kind of like my neighbor says, I really don't mind snow. It's just where it's placed that I mind. And it's the same way with trees. People say, well, yeah, I don't really mind. I just don't like where the leaves fall. I would prefer having it wide open. They're not going to change your mind. But I, I, I do think the universal thing is money. It's going to save you money. And then if you own the home and you're getting ready to sell it, you're going to make money on it too. Uh, it's going to sell faster. But if you don't own the home, it means nothing to you. So it, it's, you're not going to convince everybody, absolutely. And I, and I think it's just you, you, you try to find the winnable battles in there and appeal to those people. And that's why you're not going to get 100% camping cover. You don't want 100%. Yes. If you had to design the perfect money-saving landscape around your house and considering deciduous and coniferous trees, what would you design you? Okay. Um, your uh, morning sun beating into windows, and especially if the sunlight beats through the window and hits a hardwood floor or tile floor, that, that's, that's consuming the energy and it's going to radiate that heat out and it's going to cause you to flip on that air conditioner early. So shade the morning wet, um, sun. Roughly, to, if you have sun to between 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. and 11 a.m., so late morning-ish, that's what needs to be shaded. Then flip it over for the afternoon then. So your hot afternoon sun is going to start in right around 3 o'clock and go to dinner time. So if you can block that, that sun too with deciduous trees. Because in the wintertime, you don't want to block especially on the south side in the wintertime, you don't want to block. So the shade that you're producing so far is going to be deciduous. You're going to shade the east windows, the west windows, 
if the, it allows the sunlight into to something that can hold the energy. Then, uh, and the southern too, but east and, east and west are the most critical ones. Use um, deciduous trees, and actually your best deciduous trees are ones with compound leaves. Because trees with compound leaves, when they shed their leaves in the wintertime, is the least amount of interruption for winter solar gain. Because of the branch structure. Exactly. Exactly. Then, in terms of, of uh, if you would like to block winds uh, far enough away from your house, a good shelter belt, you're going to take, you know, you really need 150, 200 feet away from where your home is. Which so is you, not really possible in the city, but is it Yes, it is. Parks. Right, but personally, I guess. Yeah. So that's when I would say, okay, well, part, part of my landscape, I live in this town, part of my landscape is what's going on in the park. So that's a great place to put conifers. You know, conifers add a lot of interest, too. Um, and so you can have them in a residential area, but the smaller the lot is, the more I would get away from conifers, quite honestly. Because they talk about urban forest services, but they also talk about urban forest disservices. And that's what conifers can do in a small lot, or placement, blocking the winter sun. That's my opinion. Yes, Kate. Uh, with uh, increasing densities of buildings, which is which is on the on the rise, um, it seems like the planning for trees for residents and for intensive landscapes to give some respite to the more intensely developed building site is last in, mm -hmm. and and that. Even though architecture magazines have things about sustainability and the value of trees, that the civil engineering group and utilities, the architecture is still very really siloed from the concepts that you're talking about. So what we're seeing from a city level on a development review is trees are last in. They're getting stuck wherever there's a, a few bits of space that are taken up by giant utilities. And that more intensive planting of understory plants if it's not exactly required in code, doesn't happen at all. And so you have now way more people crammed into a smaller location. They don't have the luxury of a big lawn mm -hmm. and lots of shade trees that are positioned either for energy saving or for respite. Um, how do we start to help developers understand that intensively planted green space should be going hand in hand with higher density development? Uh, yeah, the, the, the question was an unanswerable one. <laughs> <laughs> is with with high density building, especially taller buildings too. We've seen so many of these rebuilds on some of these small lots in their older communities that are three and a half stories tall, and it, it really is blocking out a lot of sunlight. But the high density housing do the same thing. How do we convince builders? We don't. We don't convince them. People who buy the units, buy the buildings, convince them. You do. You do have. My brother's a builder developer, and I love him. He's my brother. Of course, I'm going to say nice things about him, but he's also a landscape architect. That's how he approaches his, so he buys large, large acreages and he creates communities. But he starts off with landforms and what he wants to create in there, recreational paths, water resources. Uh, this is Flatland Midwest, too, so he has to build all that in. Then he sets in the, ho in the houses, and, and so this environment is created. Why does he do it? Because his house sell, his houses sell long before they're completed. People want that place. I want that place. Bob Bangstrom in Minnesota, one of the premier developers, community developers in the country, does the same thing. Everybody wants a Bob Bangstrom home. I can't afford it. Still want one. On Corvette too, but uh, I, I think it's creating that demand. But I think that the higher the density becomes, the more reliant we are on preservation of spaces that already are part of the urban forest, um, parks. You know, there everybody should have five minutes, ten minutes access to a park, and, and really throwing throwing our energy and resources into those parks where people can go and play and garden. Community gardens need to be part of the urban forest, too. And not just tomatoes and beans, but fruit trees, shrubs, fruit and shrubs. So 
I can see the hook, the puppeteers to the left. Oh yeah, I'm probably stepping on some puppets. Yeah, uh, Sorry. You are. Uh, let's thank Gary for an excellent talk. Right, thank you. Uh, those of you online, many of you know the routine. We will be sharing uh, resources with you, including a link to the recording. Uh, everything you said is on tape, Gary, and will no doubt show up on CNN or something. This is uh, very interesting. Uh, and and uh, so, so we'll be in touch. Thanks, everyone, for joining us here in St. Paul and at the other sites and for tuning in. We're glad to have you. Thanks.